Software is king in Silicon Valley, and do you think um, this will change in the next 10, 20 years? So we can start from Mr. Tim. Uh, the question about software. Uh, uh, yeah, so um, so I'm working as a software company, uh, it's a VMware. Um, and I think as um, <laughs> many here. Um, so, um, so I think a couple of years ago, uh, Mark and Jason had a quote saying the software is eating the world. Um, this is the sense where you know software has a property that the development cycle is very fast, uh, especially with the internet. The software delivered as a service uh, can really have a really fast uh, pace of innovation and iteration, and that can bring new things to the end users very quickly. Um, now, at the same time, software can be very buggy and can, can have many problems. And, um, and as we have the world increasingly run by software, like I mentioned earlier, maybe I'm falling to the steam, there is a greater sense of responsibility and ethics as well, as many people are talking about the artificial intelligence and uh, the various uh, ways the machines have control over the lives of human beings. And uh, so, so clearly software is a very powerful tool that we can use to make our life better and there is a multi-billion dollar business uh, revolving around it. But at the same time, as we become coders, I understand there is a set of coders here, that I, I, I think there is a greater sense of the moral limit of where the technology should go, including software. So I think Shivam, you mentioned software is king and will continue to be that way for 20 years. Uh, like Charles, I'm a software engineer as well, so I can't uh, disagree with that statement. Uh, the, way, the reason I believe that to be the case though is if you, if you think about software and hardware, for instance, from a, a comparison standpoint, hardware tends to be fairly rigid in terms of its ability to morph, whereas software is a lot more flexible. And the reason why it continue to be king, in my opinion, is there's a lot of um, creativity in people, uh, such as yourself and a whole range of people all over the world, coming up with new ideas. And they all need a platform, so to speak, for their creativity to be emerged and showcased in the fastest possible manner. And software is that vehicle, that flexible vehicle that makes it happen which is the reason why I believe, regardless of the type of software, uh, it will continue to evolve, it will continue to increase the pace of innovation and creativity, and obviously increase the pace of productivity, all of which will increase the economic output uh, that exists. Thank you. Well, um, I'm not a software engineer. <laughs> uh, I'm a hardware engineer and uh, even materials and silicon. So I, 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 came, I came from a completely different uh, viewpoint. So uh, when I was very young, I built a, uh, a kit computer in the 1970s. And uh, everybody that did that read Byte magazine. And everybody thought the money's in the hardware. And uh, then this crazy guy called Bill Gates uh, actually wrote a uh, manifesto in that magazine saying, I don't understand why you don't give value to the software. This is going to happen in the future. I thought he was crazy. But uh, he was, uh, he was actually absolutely right. Now, over time, I've evolved, like uh, many politicians I, I, I see. But uh, I've, I've evolved where I think that uh, software is actually very important. I built pieces of equipment, capital equipment that include software and found that, uh, you know, the wheels don't turn without software. More so that from now on it's indistinguishable. You really can't build a piece of equipment without the software. The software is really what makes it uh, go and the software is absolutely an integral part of it. So I think that uh, Silicon Valley will continue doing very well in software because it really is the technology. Um, the hardware is basically a vehicle to, uh, to, to code and to make it, uh, make it do what you want it to do. So it's kind of a flexible product once you embed the software into it. So that's about all I have to say, thanks. 
I'm also a software person, um, but have uh, done some amount of work with the hardware. Um, I believe um, there'd be a strong uh, high integration between the hardware and software as we move forward. Um, a lot of things will require, especially for me, I'm coming in from the Internet of Things. Uh, software plays an extremely critical role in building value and uh, solutions. Um, that allow, for example, the thermostat is just an example of your um, variables that you wear, um, it provides you volume, how to play your heart beats, your scale information, coordination. All of these are all a combination of a hardware and a software innovation that is occurring. So I believe, um, at least in the next 10 years, um, is going to be a lot of innovation and development in the Internet of Things. Obviously, software will play a very key role, and integration is really what makes it uh, um, cause miracles to happen. Thank you, Gita. I'm going to borrow a line from Francois. I'm neither a software engineer nor a hardware engineer. But one observation I will have is in the old days when things didn't work, it was a hardware problem. These days, when something doesn't work, it's always a software problem. Thank you. I think um, I pretty much agree with everybody on the panel, but again, I think the reason software is key because it, it, it is the glue that binds everything, right? I mean, you can have a piece of hardware like the iPad, but without the apps on the iPad, it really isn't, it, it isn't meaningless. It's, it's meaningless. And if you look at it, that's really what Steve Jobs brought, right? I mean, he built PC, uh, the, the Apple, the Mac, and then he built um, the iPads and phones, but really what brought, made Apple, Apple with the applications and the whole developer ecosystem that he built around it. And again, that clearly, clearly proves that, you know, software really is the king. Um, and also, I think the barrier to entry with software is so low. I mean, it's exciting for me that an eight-year-old can, can write code, right? But for an eight-year-old to build a piece of really expensive hardware, it's, it's, it's pretty hard to conceive. So I think because the barrier to entry to software is low, um, the innovations are so much more and also exciting, especially as coders get younger and younger. So uh, that's, that's what I have to say about that. Uh, yeah, so software does um, impact Silicon Valley and no matter like all the hard hardware we can have, um, we need the software for the hardware to work. So we can move on to the next question. Um, so the way that Silicon Valley has evolved from about the 60s to now, um, do you think um, that everything that happened was a positive change, or was there some things that you didn't like that happened in the last 40 years? So I think for the most part, the changes have been extremely positive, right? Right from the time where um, HP was started in a garage, the whole garage culture, starting a cool little startup in a garage came in, and you've got Stanford, which um, got set up in the valley and really spawned. Google, for example, came out of Stanford and a whole culture of innovation. And now we have Facebook that's connecting the world and Twitter and WhatsApp. So I think there's a lot of positives there. But I think we've all talked a lot about losing the personal touch. I think, it, for me, there's something bigger where are we becoming lazy, right? I, I, look at, I look at our lives. I have DoorDash delivering food to my house. I have Instacart delivering groceries. I take Uber everywhere. It's just, I feel like I don't leave my house to do my own things anymore. I don't walk, I just have everything delivered. So really trying to think, is this making us a really lazy society where I like the whole sharing economy? Has it gone too far? And is it going to just continue making us even more complacent and lazy just because everything is now, I mean, even my laundry comes in a bag with purple tie, right? So I literally have everything delivered at home. Um, so I think that is a little bit of a negative because I feel like it's creating a whole lazy culture um, that hopefully we can get beyond. Thank you. That's well said, Anna. You know, uh, Gita was saying earlier we travel a lot uh, in our jobs and if you travel to many parts of the world, everybody looks to Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is the incubator of what is the future because technology is the future. And the thing to bear in mind, especially for the kids who are in the audience who are growing up right here in Silicon Valley, it's a very unique place. It's extremely unique that you are in a place where things are happening. Some of the most influential uh, and impactful companies uh, that are driving technology are located right here in Silicon Valley. Whether you talk about Apple, you talk about Intel, you talk about Google, you talk about Facebook, you talk about all the social media companies, 
And my advice would be, whether it's good or bad, you are in the Silicon Valley, take advantage of all the interactions, including panels like this, and try to make the best of it. Because the world, in many parts of um, the world, people are trying to replicate what Silicon Valley is. And Silicon Valley has a lot of uniqueness in it that has come about over the last 50 or 60 years, since it truly started as a Silicon Valley, when companies like Intel uh, and AMD and Fairchild and, and others started actually making technology on the hardware as we talked about, which is how it got its name, Silicon. Uh, one thing uh, I uh, would uh, caution and uh, be very careful about is, um, I know in the 90s, um, when everything seemed like uh, wonderful and everything was great, things were going up, up, up. Um, what I observed, I used to live in the East Coast and having come from there to the West Coast, uh, there was a huge uh, sense of um, entitlement and arrogance uh, that existed. Um, we need to make sure um, we are careful about that. Uh, it was almost, uh, I, I was a manager coming in here into the valley and it was a big shock. Every week there was a resignation letter on my chair um, and it was almost dictating from the engineering side in terms of uh, making changes, uh, looking for different things all the time uh, to the point that it was extremely, I think the, it was an extremely destructive uh, period. Um, now it isn't that way, but that's what it was. I hope uh, we are careful about that and not be being, becoming arrogant with uh, our own successes. Well, for me, the evolution of Silicon Valley was, uh, you know, the, the Shockley and uh, Shockley Semiconductor, and, you know, kind of like the real, real Silicon side of it, and that was absolutely the magnet for me. I wanted to come here because I had an 8080 Intel user's manual and I thought those guys were so smart. They were the magicians and I wanted to get to that hill. Um, originally from Canada, so uh, I, had to, I had to make the, uh, the long trip here. But what really makes Silicon Valley shine is, is you know, that's the magnet, but why does it work? Uh, I, I found out over many trials and errors that it's the uh, infrastructure that was so unique and fantastic here. Uh, people are here that are high school students. You are very lucky. You're, you're in the center of the universe and technology. I mean, just enjoy it and, and take advantage of it. I think it's fantastic. I wouldn't say there's really any negatives. I mean, infrastructure includes access to capital, uh, universities, uh, Berkeley. Please let's 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 mention Berkeley as well as Stanford. <laughs> and uh, I don't know why I'm saying that, but uh, there's there's that, and then there's the infrastructure, which is amazing. If you want to build a gizmo, the amazing thing about Silicon Valley is you can go find a um, a numerical machine or some operator that can make one of something with a piece of metal almost, you know, in, in one day term. Try to do that almost anywhere else. You'll see that this is a, this is a really amazing place to uh, make your ideas a reality. So, I think no real negatives. Well said, well said. Um, in my view, over the last uh, 40 plus years, uh, what has helped Silicon Valley develop and thrive there's a few consistent themes. One, I would say, is the initiative of the people. The initiative of the people, which is yourself and others. And along with that is the acceptance of different kinds of ideas, thought processes, uh, cultures, and languages, and so on and so forth. So initiative has been a big reason why I think uh, Silicon Valley has succeeded. Uh, the other aspects and attributes are, in addition to resources and such, uh, is the ability to take risks and the willingness to accept failures. I, I, I believe that as long as those things stay true, we will continue to evolve because life is a game of experimentation and realization. And uh, that is much more intense in Silicon Valley than any other place in the world, which is why I think we have an edge. But along the way, as, uh, as Geet also mentioned in the highs of the 90s, 
some of the parameters of what made Silicon Valley Silicon Valley are actually changing, and, and that should be uh, a cause for concern and a word of caution for all of us. A lot of people you know, who came here came with very grand ideas like, I'm going to change the world, I'm going to change how people work, I'm going to change how productivity happens, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I would also say and caution that the yardsticks are becoming more monitored, and that's where the entitlement mentality comes into play. It's not mentioned that money is not important, but money can't be the only score of success or failure. And, and to the degree that we get caught up in that, my worry is that we will uh, diminish and dilute uh, what makes Silicon Valley into Silicon Valley. So I would say that as you get into the workforce, as you build companies, as you dream of ideas, there has to be an incredibly strong balance between wealth creation and value creation, however you define that. Um, maybe I'll ask one question first. So how many people here were born in the United States? If you raise your hand. I, I see almost everyone is under the age of 20. <laughs> and, and I think that's a beautiful thing about Silicon Valley. It's the embodiment of the American dream. That many of us here, who are older than 20, uh, came to the United States with nothing more than a dream. Uh, and uh, invariably, this place provides an infrastructure, provides an environment that we can be whoever we want to be. As much of the, the hard work, perseverance, the imagination we can put into what we do. And, uh, and, and that's what the Silicon Valley and that's what America is. And, and for that, I'm very grateful. And, and I think we are at uh, the best place in the world. Okay, um, thank you. So, all of you guys um, here have a lot of accomplishments, are very successful. So, uh, what do you guys think your aha moment was um, that defined your path to success? Okay. Uh, my aha moment, huh? <laughs> uh, So, so I'll share uh, maybe a most difficult moment I have. Uh, I'm not sure it's an aha moment, but uh, uh, you know, it was in 2001. Right? So uh, I was a graduate student, uh, and uh, I started a company with my advisor, um, and it was a startup company. And then we had we, we moved to Silicon Valley, and it started in '98. You know, as uh, as we knew, that was a time of a lot of uh, exuberance and uh, uh, the bubble. And, and we, we had some success with the startup. In the first three years, we, we got uh, uh, a lot of investment, $50 million. We, we went to hundreds of people. We had 1,000 customers for the product we were making. In 2001, everything came down uh, to a sudden halt um, that our partner become our competitor, our customers are no longer buying, and uh, and we are going to uh, we are going to close the company. So uh, uh, so that was a very difficult time uh, for me personally. Uh, I was still quite young and didn't know any better. I thought world can only be very good. Uh, um, and uh, and what eventually happened uh, is that. Uh, uh, that, that we made the decision not to fold the company. We made the decision to find a way out. And then we had to talk to a few customers. Uh, we had to figure out a completely different product to build. And we have enough money in the bank to last us nine months. Uh, and uh, we need to build a new product from scratch that meet the customer needs, get the customer PO, you know, purchase order within that nine months so that our investor hopefully will continue fund the company. And, and that's exactly what we did. And, and, and I think that, was, that year, that nine months, was a very memorable time where we learned never to give up. And we think those harder situations are the ones that really uh, makes you stronger and makes you grow up. That's wonderful. 
Uh, in my case, I'd say that I have aha moments every single day. So uh, it's not like I'm trying to school the question, but uh, I do believe that uh, inspiration comes in small increments, uh, oftentimes, and then you have a discontinuous uh, inspiration from time to time. And, and the key thing uh, for me to have these aha moments is uh, you have to have a mindset of continuous learning and a constant inquisitiveness. Thank you. I guess, uh, you know, I would say my aha moment was, was born out of, out of uh, looking at the precipice and, and basically saying I think my company is going to auger in and be uh, one of those bleach bones in Silicon Valley that people talk about. We had uh, started a company here in uh, the uh, late 80s and uh, it was in a uh, wrong market. So marketing is important for you uh, technical people. 